Welcome back to Swordbox. Today we come to the book of Hebrews. Uh, the author of the book is unknown, but as with all scripture, the Holy Spirit is the author. Uh, it was likely written between A.D. 67 and 69, and in it compares the Levitical priesthood and the Old Testament sacrifices with the better New Testament covenant, as Christ is high priest uh, and his one sacrifice for all sins. Written most likely to a group of Hebrews, thus the title given to the Hebrews. And there are passages that have taken... Uh, to mean speaking only to believers, uh, it would lead misinterpretation inconsistent with the rest of God's Word. Uh, John MacArthur notes that proper interpretation requires a recognition that Hebrews addresses three distinct groups of Jews. Believers, unbelievers who, in, who were intellectually convinced of the Gospel, uh, unbelievers who were attracted by the Gospel in the person of Christ, but who had reached no final conviction about Him. So it's important uh, to understand whom God is speaking the context and meaning as well as to know that God who cannot lie does not contradict himself, ever. He will not tell us in one passage that our salvation is secure, and then in another passage tell us that it's not. So for me, one of the most difficult passages in all the Bible was always Hebrews chapter 6. This passage has been cause for great debate among believers, yet if we look at the whole counsel of God, as well as context, and to whom each passage is speaking to, it helps to clarify and eliminate some of the confusion. So today I hope to perhaps help you, as I have had, to work through this passage, and I pray that God's Holy Spirit will give us understanding into His Word as we go. So Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good Word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, and put Him to open shame. Now there are many who will say that this is referring to a true believer. Born again in the family of God, saved by grace through faith, named written in the Lamb Book of Life, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. If we take this passage to mean just that, then that would mean that a believer could lose his salvation. But, if you believe that, and if you take it as that, it would also mean, uh, clearly, that once lost, he or she could not be saved again. So a lost person... An enemy of God, dead in their sins, could come to Christ and be forgiven. But a child of God, redeemed by the blood of Christ, born again and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, if they were to fall away, could not come back to Christ. So those who interpret the passage this way have two problems. First of all, clearly elsewhere, surely uh, Scripture clearly shows that our salvation is secure. It's not kept by us, it's kept by Christ, with the Holy Spirit as our guarantee. Jesus said in John 10, 27-30, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And as we've discussed, the scripture is full of verses that uh, assure the believer of his being secure in Christ, sealed until the day of redemption. And you might want to take a look at John 6, 37 through, through 40 if you're still struggling with that. Secondly, those who um, teach that a believer can lose their salvation um, also teach that they can return to Christ and be saved again and again and again, which is if you take this passage to be speaking to believers, uh, that can't happen. <clears throat> so they have two problems when they interpret it that way. But as we look at this passage, the words used to describe the person, uh, it can make us sit up and take notice. It, it would appear that a true believer is being described. Uh, the word enlightened means a person has come to the point through a process that the gospel is true. It's verified to him. Tasted uh, the heavenly gift to give one a taste, just like we might taste a uh, particular food. Become partakers of the Holy Spirit means to take part in or to share in. And of course the word tasted again uh, about the good word uh, simply means to taste something. All of these... Uh, out of all of these, the one that seems to point to salvation the most always for me was become partakers of the Holy Spirit. But that does not mean being indwelt by the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized in the Holy Spirit. All descriptions used elsewhere in Scripture to describe true believers. A lost person can be under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he must be in order to be led to Christ. It's God's Holy Spirit that leads us to Christ. Think about Judas. He was chosen by Jesus as one of the twelve disciples. Certainly he was enlightened. He tasted the heavenly gift and experienced the work and the moving of the Holy Spirit. He walked with the Son of God for three years. Yet in Luke 22.3, the Bible records, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. 
Satan or a demon cannot enter a saved person who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Judas was not a believer. He was lost. People say, oh, but didn't he partake of the Holy Spirit? He was sent out by the others, uh, by Jesus, with the others by Jesus. Luke 9, 1 records this. It says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Well, G Judas did take part in ministry, preaching, perhaps even being a part of miracles. But listen to this in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and following. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Well, many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And just what is the will of the Father? Well, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day, John 6.40. Unless we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are outside the will of God and outside the family of God. We may believe Jesus is real, God is real, go to church, be involved, experience the working of the Holy Spirit, but until we receive Him into our hearts by faith, we're not His. And although Judas put part in all those miracles and all those things that didn't make him a Christian. I believe the passage here in Hebrews 6 is addressing those who have come all the way to saving knowledge of Christ. Yet they're still hanging on to Judaism and Old Testament law. If after receiving full knowledge and conviction, experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit, if they fall away, turn back to Judaism, then there is no other hope for them. There is only one way to salvation, and if they reject that, then it's impossible for them to be renewed or born again. Just like Jesus spoke um, to those who were blaspheming the Holy Spirit with full evidence and manifestation of God's Holy Spirit convicting them and the Son of God standing in front of them, they rejected truth. They called what was holy evil and there remained no other hope for them. They, dam they damned themselves to eternal judgment. In verse 9 we have a good summary. Uh, it says, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things accompanying salvation. A real believer goes beyond head knowledge beyond tasting and enlightenment. They move into the spirit-filled life and abiding in Christ. And Jesus himself said in John 6.39, This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all that he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Can't be talking about true believers here. Praise God that my salvation from start to finish is kept by Jesus Christ. I am not walking through life on a thin sheet of ice praying I don't fall through and drown. How could I ever be anxious for nothing if I was constantly afraid that I could lose my salvation? And I've been there before, never really knowing um, exactly how I could lose it or if this thing was bad enough to lose it or that thing. Man, we are secure in Christ because Jesus Christ is holding on to us. It's not that we're holding on to Him. He is holding on to us. The Bible says, Beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things concerning salvation. Hope this has been some help to you. I know I kind of had to go really fast to get it all in here. But uh, it's good stuff, man. Spend some time reading through this passage and praying over it. Allow God to open your eyes to the truth of His Word. See you back here tomorrow.